It's just an honor to be here. I think that the work that the NEABPD does is so critical. And um, you know, it's really kudos to the people involved, Perry, and all the people that she works with to support the public in greater awareness about BPD. And it's also an honor to be on this panel with um, people who have been kind of role models and mentors to me. Charlie was my DBT trainer. And John was um, somebody I met very early in my research career and really helped me to kind of crystallize some thinking about how to better understand these disorders. I do DBT, I do MBT, I do GPM. I'm very informed by the work of Otto Kernberg, and I do agree that all these treatments work very well, and patients need treatments that are tailored to them rather than having clinicians who are obsessed with one way of thinking. So I want to continue the vein of thought here and really think about how mentalization-based treatment offers a lot of similar components as these other treatments, maybe packaged differently and related to a different set of concepts and research, but hopefully provides a different way of thinking about individuals that might be um, satisfying and effective for both the clinicians who deliver this treatment and the patients who receive it. Uh-oh. Okay, so this is the agenda for today, and I have to um, say that trying to summarize the last 10 years of uh, advance in MBT is a very difficult task. I'll do my best and talk about updates in theory. I think this is one thing that I really respect about Peter and Anthony is their kind of unending effort to incorporate new findings into the way that they think about how their treatment works. And I'm also going to present some evidence that's, I think, relevant to a lot of these different treatments on the interpersonal problems in BPD and the way that people with BPD represent what goes on in relationships in their own minds and then behaves based on those representations. And I'm going to talk about some expansion in the way that the practice of MBT has progressed. But I'm going to start with a little mantra that I think defines the culture at the Gunderson residence. It's the new serenity prayer. Um, and I do have some jokes. They might not be good ones, but I'll try that. And um, I think it's about having some good defenses, humor, a sense of taking responsibility from oneself, and also acceptance. And I think that actually is incorporated in all three of these treatments. But I put this up here because I have an apology for you. I have to admit, I have a little bit of an obsessional personality, and I've worked on my slides since they were due. So some of these are not in your slide set. But I do encourage you that, I think this is recorded. You can kind of look back at this and try to reference it and try to kind of stay with me instead of worry about what's on the slides. They're really just a device to help you learn and understand. Or maybe look at something instead of listening to me. So I'm going to talk first about theory and formulation behind this treatment. Like John had mentioned, this is really a treatment that is based on some general, broad capacity that we all have to mentalize. And what that means is that um, we all have a capacity to understand what's in our minds, driving the things that we do. And also try to imagine what's in the minds of others when they interact with us. That's, it's simple as that. It took me like 10 years to maybe boil it down to something so simple. But it's something that we all do that all treatments really have to do with. But I think the power of MBT is the way it bridges both the past to the present. It incorporates basic fundamentals that have been provided to us by psychoanalytic ideas about how we just think about things, imagine them, conceptualize them, represent them, symbolize them, with something more modern that is really hot in um, scientific investigation, that is social cognition and theory of mind. And that has to do with appreciating what goes on in the mental activity of other people, how we model that, how we imagine that, how we conceptualize that, and how effective we are in that capacity. MBT also has to do with relationships, just like TFP, and fundamentally um, helps people to improve their capacity to organize the complex interaction between self and other. 
not just on the outside, that is the external behavior, but on the inside. All their thoughts, feelings, beliefs, motives, preferences, desires, that is very complicated for us all, whether or not you have BPD. So in these interplays, there's the behavioral parts, the part that you can see, the part that you can kind of interpret, and there are internal parts, the part that you have to guess about. And there are interactions between the self and the other that make this process very dynamic and fast moving, even more so when you're working with BPD. And it takes the capacity to hold a lot of things in mind and manipulate them, think about them, and react to them. Now beyond that, there are two psychological aspects that mentalization has to do with. It's both in the cognitive realm and in the affective realm, like John was saying, and these things are fused. And MBT is really to do with helping people integrate these two parts of their mental activity. And as you can see, when it comes to the cognitive realm, there's a number of different things involved. I won't belabor them. They're on the slide. And in the affective realm, there's a number of complex facets and these things really interact. And the goal of MBT is to help people integrate them so that they can feel clearly and emotionally know themselves. Okay, that's different than just being aware of your emotions. It's different than just being aware of your thoughts. It's about integrating some felt experience that you can think about. Now, there's also two modes of mentalizing. That is an implicit mode that we all do. There are automatic things that we think about that we're completely unaware of when we don't pay attention to them. And these are assumptions. These are things that constitute like a kind of elephant in the room in a relationship. They're the things we don't talk about or attend to that can become explicit. That is, that we think about them in psychotherapy or when we're mindful or when we meditate, and we talk about them. And these modes can kind of evolve and interact. And lastly, there's a kind of switching point about this. And this is like a kind of advance in the understanding about mentalization. It has to do with stress. I think John talked a little bit about this, and one of the questions had to do with this, is that for all of us, mentalizing changes under stress. And I kind of joked with Emily, it was in a vulnerable moment of high stress for me that I completely lost my mind and agreed to do this. <laughs> I gave four talks before I came here in the last two weeks, and I have a problem, a target behavior of overcommitment. And I just completely was not thinking when I said, yes, I want to do it. Because emotionally, I love NEABPD. I love this conference. I love speaking to families and consumers and professionals about BPD. But I did not think it was realistic to devote the time. So I had a switch point, OK? My prefrontal cortex, the part that can evaluate, strategize, plan, problem solve, you know, is starting to mentalize. But then it switches over from stress to like automatic behaviors, okay? So like my impulses, my emotions will guide my behaviors instead of the part of my brain that can evaluate what's going on both in, in my reality and in my mind. So the thing about this is that for people who have sensitive stress systems, like people with BPD among other disorders, your ability to mentalize will rise with stress actually. If you don't have any stress, you can't think. You know, that's why the, the state of withdrawal for people with BPD is very problematic. You can't organize thoughts when you don't have enough stimulation. But when you have more stress, you actually mentalize more, but it hits a point at which it becomes counterproductive. You can't think under too much stress. That's all of us. But for people with BPD, they're more sensitive to stress, and there's a switch point that might be activated by the activation of attachment for people with BPD or other, other people who have very insecure attachment styles. The attachment itself, where it's designed to help people regulate in the face of stress, actually produces more stress. And it causes people to go into this kind of subcortical mode where your emotions and impulses and kind of urge to act really start to dominate your behavior, your behavioral kind of pathways. So, you know, what happens here, just like I've said, psychological understanding drops and is rapidly replaced by confusion about what's going on in one's mind under high arousal. I do not have BPD, or so John has not diagnosed me yet, and I, I have this phenomenon. Under enough stress, I cannot think clearly. 
So this is an advance and clarification in thinking, is that what we're to do in MBT is help people have more flexibility around how they mentalize, so that it's not so split and divided or extreme. So that the goal is to differentiate and also understand the interaction between self and other in one's life and in psychotherapy, so that you can see what the other person might be thinking, and also reduce your own sensitivity to the other people state of mind. You know, I think BPD has to do with sensitivity to states of mind. And it's about moving from being Im implicit, you know, assumption-based and automatic reflexive in your mentalizing to being more controlled, thoughtful, flexible, and evaluating in the current moment. It's also about being able to kind of move between external cues of what people are thinking like, this person didn't call me, therefore they don't love me. That's kind of an external preoccupation to something internal. Hmm, I wonder what's going on with this person that caused them to behave that, that way. And it's about connecting feelings to thoughts and overcoming splitting of these two things. And that is, again, the feeling of feelings. Okay? So this is just a graphic to help you see this. It kind of goes from being impression-driven to more control, appearance-based, to more inference or imagination, from certainty. Some people with BPU will say, I know this is true. There's nothing you can say that will convince me otherwise. And this goes to doubt. And from emotional contagion to some independence and understanding what is going on in oneself and others. So now that I've told you the basics of mentalization, I'm going to talk about the basis theoretically. And when MBT was first developed, it was really founded in uh, attachment theory and attachment research, which really joins kind of traditional psychoanalytic think thinking with some empirical basis. So that, like John said, I'm going to just ba basically talk about the basics of attachment theory. There is like a kind of call-in series I think I've done that's on the NEA BPD website if you want more detail about this. But just to boil it down, attachment is a basic instinctual response we all have. And we all have behaviors when we're young to bid for attachment. Babies cry. They act distressed in a variety of ways. They are cute. Thank God they're cute. It's like a survival element. And attachment gets activated when a person or a child is distressed. It's not, every relationship is not an attachment relationship. It's those relationships you rely on under stress that are attachment relationships. And what you get from attachment can be disturbed when there's problems early on, okay? So you can get the problem of the insecurity in multiple domains, like John was saying. It's not just about specific symptoms. It's domains of dysfunction. So insecurity and attachment will be associated with inability to regulate, contain, and modulate affect. That's how attachment is relation, related to emotional dysregulation. It also disturbs what we call the secure base. The secure base is that confidence to explore the world and encounter risk and know that you're going to be OK because of the relationships you have in your life. And it also disturbs the future ability to develop and maintain meaningful relationships. And I'm going to talk about some advances in research that help us understand more specifically what goes wrong in relationships in um, people who have BPD. I'm just going to skip that. And this is all um, kind of explained more in detail in that call-in series, so please look at it. So the relationship between attachment and mentalization is this, is that when you have a secure attachment, you can think more. You're less scared. You're more regulated. You're less alone. That happens for all of us, not just for people who have BPD. And when you mentalize better, guess what? Your attachments work better, right? When you can understand what's going on with the person you need, and communicate effectively with them and collaborate, then you're going to actually enhance that attachment. So this goes back and forth. And more specifically, what happens developmentally is this. Is the top a pointer? Yeah, OK. 
So you start with the child in this state of arousal. When you're a baby, you don't know what's wrong with you. You just cry and you hope someone will figure it out. It's a nonverbal expression. And the job of the caregiver is to mirror back in a reasonably contingent, that means like a kind of resonant way, but in a metabolized way, a marked way. So that's a representation of what the caregiver thinks is going on in the child's mind. And that expression or representation helps people to develop a psychological understanding of themselves. This binds with that kind of felt experience. Okay, so that joins psychological thought with experiential um, data. Okay. So what happens in BPD is very complicated because it's not that people with BPD don't get attached. The problem is they get too attached and that creates too much stress for the mentalizing system. So when I first started this, there was a lot of really interesting research that confirmed that insecure attachment is um, associated with BPD. There are over 20 studies. They're um, summarized in these papers. And in particular, there's a kind of um, uneasy fit between a clingy attachment style preoccupation with a fearful one. So clingy is OK. You don't, you're not going to necessarily have problems if you're clingy. And being a little mistrustful is OK in itself. But when you have both, you both really need people and you don't trust them, that's a problem. OK? And that is something that's um, relevant to BPD. But in my own study that uh, we use the data from the larger family study um, that, of personality that we did at McLean, uh, we found that people with major depression also have a higher risk of this attachment style, but at a lesser severity than people with BPD. So what happens is interactional. When there are attachment problems, I think there's too much of a kind of reflexive impulse to blame the parents. That's, that's really an incomplete understanding of the problem. There's an interaction between a vulnerable person and their caregiver that drives an interactional process. I think that's what's so important about attachment. It's a system. So if you start with a child who makes an attachment bid that's clingy, angry, passive or helpless and oscillatory. It's confusing, it's oftentimes detached from what they're really feeling. It's conflicted, it sends mixed messages, and sometimes it's controlling. So what happens for the caregiver is this, they get over-involved, they get overprotective, they get inconsistent because they have to put so much energy into managing the attachment, and then they burn out or they give up or they feel ineffective. And they sometimes will also get roped in, into intense affective states where they respond to the child in either frightening or frightened ways. So when your child tries to commit suicide, you're going to be frightened. And that's going to get communicated in the interaction. And that is what completes that attachment transaction, is the interaction between the two, that is their emotional responses, their behavioral responses, and how it is they understand each other. So what happens is when your patient or child or friend or partner with BPD is in the bottom, not just a child, but a person in a constitutional state of arousal that they don't understand, they can't represent in their mind, they send these extreme signals, suicide, self-sabotage, self-harm, reckless behavior, to a caregiver that can't put aside their own emotional reaction. So it's no longer representing what they think is going on with the child. It's representing an amplified form of a negative emotion. Okay? So you can see how that contributes to problems in mentalization. It's a systems problem. It's not just on the end of the person with BPD or their parents. It's interactive. So this is what happens in families, which I do a lot of family work. It's one of my favorite things, like John was saying about couples. It's far more interesting, fast-paced, and it is really important to the work of helping people with BPD get better. So say you have family member one. They're in high emotion, and they don't mentalize well. None of us do on high emotion. And then they make efforts, instead of to cope or relate, they make efforts to control. 
cha or change themselves or others. So oftentimes when the patients at the GR, we, we talk about how they're trying to control the situation rather than cope with it, like perfectionism. That's a perfect example of trying to control the thing that you're going to have a lot of emotion about rather than cope with the possible emotion you're going to have about it. And what happens then is controlling behavior. Sorry about this. And then there's a family member who cares about this person. That with this cycle, it affects high emotion in that person. And that engenders poor mentalizing. And then they make efforts to control themselves and others. And these things interact. So you can see how this gets really hyperactivated very quickly. Now, this happens in therapy, too, which is the problem of trying to use non-personality-focused um, treatments for people with personality problems. Yes, we need generalist approaches, but they have to be informed by an understanding of dysfunction in per personality functioning rather than just a kind of treatment for depression or a treatment for bipolar disorder, has to really focus on the problems and sensitivities of a person with BPD or other PDs. And so what happens in a treatment is the same process where a patient will have an emotional challenge. They have mild distress and anxiety. And then they activate their attachment, which is necessarily going to be hyper-aroused, conflicted, disorganized, problematic. And this causes even more interaction that causes more problems for both the therapist and the patient. So that's the problem of treatment with BPD. And then the biobehavioral switch gets kind of put into this kind of automatic process much earlier than for people without these attachment problems. So that your access to thinking, representing, conceptualizing, ima managing, Im imagining, being flexible about different points of view goes offline. You're too challenged by the interpersonal contact. So what happens here is a failure of mentalization. And at first, this was kind of conceptualized in more like kind of simplified and maybe exclusive ways. And what Bateman and Fonagy said is that there's temporary failures of mentalizing. Because people with BPD are actually really good at mentalizing in some situations. It's not across all contexts. It's in specific situations where under hyperactivated attachment or intense affect, they'll either go into a detached mode. And this is where people with BPD might be the best patient you ever had. They're smart. They're psychological. They absorb the information very well, but it might be completely dissociated and disconnected from what they actually feel or what's going on in their life. That's a problem of pretend mode, pseudo-mentalization. And it's, it's a failure to integrate. They're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Then there's psychic equivalence, where they will tend to believe what is in their mind is reality. I'm bad. I can't do anything right. There's no... Nothing's going to change that, that psychic equivalence. And then teleologic mode, which is the need to have external proof for internal states. So you must drop everything and get on a plane to show me that I matter to you. You must extend the sessions to show me that you care. I must cut myself to show you I'm in pain. Okay. And this leads to the problems of BPD. So you can read this, because I have too many slides to go over. And what I want to say is that this leads to all the domains of symptomatology in BPD in the MBT theory, and that what they've updated is this. And I'll show you some literature on this. There's also a fourth kind of concept, is that people with BPD hypermentalize. That is, that they, they actually have these really elaborate, complicated assumptions about what's going on with other people. It's like they have a dysregulation of mentalizing. And this also feeds into the problem. I'll talk more about that. OK. So basically, the kind of strengths of MPT is that it, it combines all these ideas that come from attachment into a treatment. The drive for relationships, for comfort, emotional regulation, and secure base is at the bottom of this treatment. The, the technique is not just MBT, it's that you use the relationship to help the person to survive stress. There's a real relationship represented in the here and now. It's not about the past. It's about the here and now and the interactions in one's life and in the treatment itself. 
And the attachment security that can be attained in the treatment, whether you're doing e DBT, MBT, TFP, steps, whatever it is, the attachment security will allow your patient to explore their minds and try to do something that's productive for themselves. Or else they have too much fear, self-doubt, pain to be able to manage that. So you try to stabilize and encourage mentalizing through stress in this treatment and through these hyperactivated attachment states and reestablish something that is a piece of progress in mentalization-based treatment thinking that is reestablish epistemic trust and collaboration. And I'll show you some data on what that exactly means. So this is a revision to MBT that I think is both elegant and complicated. Now, what we've learned about attachment since that research came out is that attachment is a nonspecific factor that confers risk for developing a lot of psychiatric problems. Attachment is something that people use to modulate a stressful situation. When I'm stressed, I rely on my partner, my friends, my colleagues, my research assistant to help me survive, okay? But that is something that when it's not there, I might get depressed, I might get anxiety, I might get interpersonal problems, I might get dysregulated emotion. There's a lot of outcomes that come from insecure attachment. And insecure attachment is associated with a number of disorders on both what was previously called axis one and two. Now, trust in social learning is a more specific issue that probably also relates to a number of different um, disorders, but there's new evidence that shows that the locus of the problem is here for people who have BPD. And John alluded to this too, is that there's these interpersonal sensitivities that people with BPD seem to really be defined by, that the interpersonal dysfunction instability is really differentiating and at the, at the center of some of the other symptomatology but these factors probably also um, increase risk for a number of disorders that tend to be comorbid with BPD, explaining why people with BPD tend to have other disorders. This is a review that was done by Brooks Kinkasas and a colleague of his that really reviews the kinds of social cognitive problems that seem to be at the basis of a number of disorders. But what you see here is that what he has discovered with Flanagy and some other colleagues is that the problem in BPD is distrust. Now, we have a lot of new tools that are enhanced to try to help us understand the behavioral um, functioning of a person in a socially stressful situation that models their social functioning in a laboratory where you can measure things like brain functioning. Okay? And what we've really started to employ are a number of like kind of behavioral economic models where the, the subjects have to interact with other subjects and make decisions on the fly. And why this is an improvement is a lot of people, whether you have a disorder or not, don't know themselves very well. And when we tried to get people to rate their own mentalization who had BPD, people who had poor mentalizing rated themselves very high because they, they don't know if they're mentalizing. So self-report is very inadequate for a lot of different things that people try to measure. So you have to build models that really test a kind of more procedural, active, behavioral component of what you're trying to measure. So a groundbreaking study was done by uh, Kings Cassis and his colleagues that was published in Science. I, include, I encourage you to read the paper. I had to read it like maybe 10 to 20 times to understand it. But basically, I'll try to boil it down to you. Um, it's a very elegant study that is a multi-round economic exchange where there's healthy, and, healthy control subjects and BPD subjects that are put in the position of interacting with an investor. So it's that you give money, you receive money, and you make decisions about what you're gonna do, and inherent in that interaction is a modeling of understanding what the other person is gonna do, and some trust, okay? So what this study showed is that people with BPD have an incapacity to maintain cooperation, and when there is a problem that happens in the interaction, their ability to repair it is really um, limited. 
And this is related to differential brain functioning in an area of the brain that has to do with emotional and social processing. And the conclusion that came from this is that people with BPD may have atypical social norms and a lack of an ability to imagine and decide about a partner's trustworthiness, okay? So how this happens is this. This is the breakdown. So what happens is that there are a group of people that are playing a healthy trustee with a healthy investor, and the investor takes $20 and repays the trustee uh, $60, okay? And now you have to reinvest. And there's also a group with a healthy investor and a person with BPD. And what you see here is striking, that in the healthy control group, the percentage invested is you know, pretty similar. There's no significant difference between early and late in the interaction in healthy groups. But in BPD, something breaks down over time. The level of investment at the end drops significantly because there's some rupture that can't be repaired in the interaction. And what happens is this thing called coaxing. Once there's a kind of disappointment, like the investor doesn't send very much to the trustee, the, the trustee and the investor have to interact in a way that tries to encourage the other person to collaborate again. In healthy people, this happens a lot more, and the payoff over time is high. This is the percentage of coaxing in healthy investors versus those with BPD who will just keep not interacting or not trying to encourage the other person to get back into the game with them. And this is even more interesting. When you look at the insula activity, which has to do with emotional processing, also sensing things within the body, and it has something to do with empathy. It's implicated in maternal and romantic love. What happens is that when there's a low level investment, it's very active and there's a very linear, clear response with the level of investment. For people who have BPD, there's no kind of rhyme or reason to what activity goes on in this part of the brain based on what's happening in reality, what's happening in their interaction. And sometimes when you're interacting with a person with the vulnerabilities of BPD, sometimes you're left with, like, why, why, why in the world are they thinking that? Or what in the world are they thinking? And they may be responding to something offline. It's deep in their brain, their emotions, their memories, things that have nothing to do with it, the current interaction. And so when you actually um, assess things like trust, you see, not surprisingly, people with uh, out BPD have higher levels of self-reported trust. And the percentage return to the investor, because of this, I think, is higher. And so the return to the person with BPD who is struggling with mistrust is also lower. So the ability to self-enhance is limited by this problem in trust. Now, um, there's been some work on the hormone oxytocin because it stimulates social bonding. And there is some evidence that it increases mentalization when you squirt it up the nose. So when you're asking a spouse for a favor, <laughs> little intranasal oxytocin can go a long way. Okay. Understand my position. But if it only were that easy, I think we wouldn't need programs like the Gunderson Residence because there was another study done on this to see if actually oxytocin helped people with BPD to trust more and it doesn't. It actually makes them defect and collaborate less. Isn't that amazing? So there's something in the system. So this is an economic task. You can read about it. I'm not going to belabor the setup. But what happens is that there are differences between the healthy controls and the people with BPD in their expectations of what their partner is going to do in the game. And people with um, out BPD actually increase in trust with oxytocin. People with BPD decrease significantly. Also, in terms of um, response to this cooperation task economically, people without BPD increase their cooperation with the oxytocin, people with BPD decrease. And it seems to be related to attachment status, actually. And what happens is for this kind of attachment, high anxiety and high avoidance, that's that double bind attachment, preoccupied but fearful. When you administer oxytocin, cooperative behavior goes down. Okay? And this is the bind for family members of people who have BPD. When they get very vulnerable, they come to you, but then they push you away. 
and it creates this exhausting cycle that makes it hard for you to keep up your mentalizing, right? Same for therapists, and it's devastating for the individual with BPD because it only feeds into their confusion and mistrust. So there's a different concept that is related to this issue of trust, and it's, it has to do with trust about information and how you learn and generalize things, whether it's from psychotherapy or from experience. And this is something that I have to say, you know, Peter Fonagy just boggles my mind. He has new ideas all the time. They sound extremely elegant, and then when I try to repeat them, it just, like, it's paralyzing. So I'll do my best. So when it comes to social learning, there are a couple things that we, we do to judge whether the information is trustworthy. You can judge it based on the content. You know, you can evaluate, is that reasonable, realistic, relevant to me? And you can judge it based on the authority. Now, I'm a sucker for Peter Fonagy. Whatever he says sounds good to me. But, you know, in children, really small children, they actually take in a lot of information about who to trust and not to trust. They've done very elegant studies of children getting information from people they know versus people they don't know, which is right and wrong. And they will recalibrate how they respond to this information over time. They think a lot. And so what helps this process of learning is something called extensive cues. This is a signal that helps a parent and child to um, have joint attention on something and see it as important and worthwhile and generalizable, okay? So you see this mother and child learning how to brush teeth, you know? So this includes like a kind of eye contact, a kind of way of speaking. And I think to say that um, attachment really makes mentalizing go haywire. Before I had kids, I thought I would never do baby talk. <laughs> but once I had kids, the things that came out of my mouth were extraordinary. <laughs> and they have to do with ostensive cues. You see your baby and you're like, hi, baby. Oh, do, 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 do. Oh, boop, 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 boop. And it's like a kind of opening of the communication highway, okay? If you go up to your child and you're like, because you're tired, you gave four talks a week, they're not going to kind of engage with you the same way and take what you have to say as seriously. It won't be as emotionally salient to them. And there are some studies. This one is amazing. And I can't say I understand it completely, but I'll try to tell you what I understand about it. Infants 18 months old, they're able to learn about this emotional expression of a person non-verbally. And they can generalize it based on whether or not they get this extensive cue. This, hi, baby, hello. That makes a big difference. That's why we instinctually do that kind of stuff. So this is how it boils down. It's in your packet. But basically what happens is there are these two very strange objects that a baby will not be familiar with. And there's a very nice research assistant. And she has an extensive cue here. And she smiles at one of the objects, and she like makes a bad smell face to the other one. And this 18-month-old doesn't have much vocabulary. Will give somebody else the right object 70% of the time. Is that amazing? Who said babies can't mentalize? But you take the same person and make them non-communicative. Okay, and this is what we can appreciate about the fragility of attachment. Some days I'm like this after a long day of work. You're tired, okay? you're not attending, and you express the same thing. And the percentage of producing the same object for a different person drops significantly without that extensive cue. Isn't that amazing? But if you actually have the same person without the extensive cue come back for the object, the percentage of giving the right object goes up. So babies can make this person-specific inference about what somebody likes better or what's better, but they only generalize that to another person if there's an extensive cue, if there's a welcoming attitude. And I think this has something to do with why the treatments for BPD work. It allows the clinicians who employ the treatments to maintain the capacity for extensive cues. Okay? gives them organization, support, understanding of that patient to, to really support their ability to provide those extensive cues. So how MBT therapy works based on this really new research, it just came out, 
it's really conceptualizing BPD as a problem of trust. These are smart people. Some of the smartest people I ever met came to my program. And they still can't function at a basic level. It's not an intelligence problem. But it's a problem of trust and learning, OK? Without new learning, there's no change. And when you have a, a, a epistemic mistrust, you trust what's in your mind, your trust, you mistrust what's in your mind, and you mistrust the information presented to you because you're too distressed, too in pain. There's a problem of generalizing any information to find solutions to problems that you have. So therapy must open a person's mind to social learning through collaboration and extensive cues. That's a kind of advance in mentalization-based theory. And I think this angelic face of Anthony Bateman helps. They're really wonderful people. I think that's part of why their treatment works. So this is a kind of reconsideration that applies to a lot of things, not just BPD. This is for educational achievement. Basically, attachment security, it's just a bedrock to a lot of things. It helps you develop social cognition, understanding others in social interactions, understanding how you should behave and how you behave impacts others. That, in turn, affects self-regulation, both attentional problems, that is why so many people with BPD have ADHD or something that looks like it. And it also causes problems of impulsivity. Down here, it affects interpersonal functioning, of course. And both the way that they interact with systems that will become problematic and use support systems and kind of get some self-esteem from the relationships they're in. And this is kind of tied together with this ability to keep the information highway alive. Okay, to think, to evaluate, to let information in and then generalize it to different contexts. All right. So there are other advances in MBT treatment that has to do with the measurement of MBT mentalizing, which John alluded to. There was this kind of primary approach that had to do with coding these, these interviews about attachment. I myself, that was the first thing I did after graduating from residency is fly to London and learn how to do the AAI, and it's incredibly arduous. It's a very time-consuming, resource-intensive tool, and while it's very elegant, it's limited. And so when I started my postdoc, I was really interested in how do you measure this thing. And in the last 10 years, there's been enormous advance, partly because the Germans have so much money. <laughs> But um, basically, the first stab at this was looking at the eyes and what they convey. And so this is the mind and the eyes test that was kind of first used in trying to help people, to help differentiate people from, with autism from people without. So this is your test. How, how autistic or not autistic are you? This is hard. OK, so what do you think this is? Oh, good job. OK, how about this one? This one's harder. Sure about something. OK, good, good. Nothing too embarrassing there. Now, the problem is that when they tried to see if there were differences between BPD and people without BPD in this um, kind of test, what they found was surprising. So who do you think's white? They're the BPD subjects. They do better on this test. This is from Eric Furtuck, who works with John. So I think the real reason that clinicians don't want to work with patients with BPD has nothing to do with their difficulties or untreatability, but how super in tune they are with reading the therapist's mind. <laughs> the other day, a patient came in the office. I was trying to like dial a number for her parents. And she's like, are you mad at me? And I'm like, no, yes. <laughs> She knew I was mad at her before I knew I was mad at her, OK? So there are updates now. There are better tools. And this is a movie that was created by some researchers in Berlin. It's an amazing movie, but it takes so long for research to make it to the mainstream that you'll see that the kind of personas are like from the 80s or something. But this is how it works. So there are these movie clips. Um, they're incredibly cheesy but they're very useful. So this is Cliff and Sandra. She's having a dinner party. They seem to enjoy themselves when Cliff is talking about his vacation to Sweden. But then Michael arrives. 
he seems to be a narcissist. He dominates the conversation, directing his speech at Sandra alone. Slightly annoyed by Michael's bragging story, Sandra shortly looks in Cliff's direction and then asks Michael, tell me, have you ever been to Sweden? What's going on here? Now this is your pop quiz. Your chance to show that you're not autistic. Why is Sandra asking this? One, to see if Michael has something interesting to say. <laughs> Two, to change the topic so Cliff can become involved in the conversation. Three, <laughs> people actually give these answers. And four, to bond with Cliff because they both <laughs> seem to like turtles. Now, they actually use this to test people with BPD versus people without. And the amazing thing about this is Mind and the Eyes didn't necessarily differentiating, differentiate high-functioning autism from normals, but did autism from normals. And with BPD, I showed you that BPD people are actually better at doing this. But with this particular assessment, it did differentiate people from, with BPD from those without. And you see here is that people with BPD they actually didn't have differences with the healthy people in reading the, eye, the mind and the eyes, but they did on these mask scores. Amazing. And what happened, before I move on, is that they also saw that people with BPD with trauma did worse than the other two groups. So there's a role of trauma in the ability to kind of intuit what's going on in more complex, dynamic um, interaction interpersonally. Now, there's also really interesting research that comes out of Baylor with Carla Sharp, who I think is an amazing mind and uh, does really interesting research. She uh, has worked on an inpatient adolescent unit and found that hypermentalizing, this kind of excessive thinking about what's going on with people and complex, elaborate assumptions about what they're thinking, is correlated with BPD traits. And this actually explains something about what has been called borderline empathy, okay? So borderline empathy was a term that was introduced like pretty early on, I think 80s, 90s, and there were a bunch of researchers who did some early research on this interpersonal social cognitive phenomenon with people with BPD. And what they found is that people with BPD had greater levels of nonverbal sensitivity to what was going on to other people, and also better ability to rate the emotions in other people. And what was funny about this one study by, done by Laticius and Phil, I'll probably pronounce the names wrong, is that they rated people's ability to understand other group members' emotions, and the people with BPD did it as well as the psychiatrists. <laughs> That's why group therapy works for people with BPD. They're so good at helping each other. Now, but there's something more subtle that happens, is that people with BPD are really good at the kind of cognitive, behaviorally driven, like kind of explicit domains, but less skilled in understanding what's happening inside where there's no evidence for it and where it has to do with emotions. And the problem is more a lack of balancing between these two modes than that it's completely absent, okay? And that hypermentalizing seems to be mediated um, the relationship between hypermentalizing and BPD is mediated by emotional dysregulation. So there's a role of emotional dysregulation, which is a core problem in B, um, BPD per DBT, and this interpersonal kind of representational disturbance. So this is a complex model of how we put all that we know about social cognition, BPD, together, that there is a person with BPD as a receiver of signals. That is how they understand what's going on with others, their impaired or unstable capacity for emotional empathy, which is decreased by childhood trauma and PTSD and challenged by levels of high arousal. And then there are, is BPD as the center of social signals. that This is really interesting. People with BPD, although they're known for a lot of emotional intensity and um, outward displays of anger and helplessness, they actually have reduced facial activity during some interpersonal interactions, which makes it harder for other people to understand what's going on with them. And this re relates to some of the symptoms that we try to treat in these disorders. And I think this side of it, the reduced facial activity, is underappreciated because a lot of people think about the crisis generating behaviors or the acting out behaviors, or whatever terminology you want to use. But you know what I find is that 
Families really relate to this, the new smileys. I'm seconds away from bursting into tears, same face. I'm actually incredibly angry, same face. You will never, ever know how I really feel. Okay? And this might be due to the work of the half smile. Maybe, maybe it's Marsha's fault. Okay. So with treatment outcomes, there are also advances. So I'm not going to belabor this, but these are the original studies that show that MBT worked better than treatment as usual. Okay? That's, what, that's what the early studies looked like. Um, looked at is that comparison is that it decreases suicidal and self-harming acts, depressive symptoms, use of um, really intensive and expensive um, public health resources. And it does increase social and interpersonal functioning, but not really that robustly. And it actually is not a cost issue. MBT might seem um, financially resource heavy at the front end, but it turns out to be a savings in terms of intensive psychiatric services. MBT has the longest course of follow-up. This study was um, looked at at eight years, and the MBT groups maintained their gains and actually continued to get better after treatment ended. And this has been replicated by other groups and has been done in outpatient and adolescent settings. Now this, I think, is really the important part, is that I think we're at a point in the development of these treatments to let go of our territorial kind of natures and get into this horse race about what's better. That's not useful. <coughs> to really serve the public and the people who need these treatments, we have to scale treatments to make them generally available and give the more intensive treatments to the people who are more complicated, okay? Not just to the people who can afford them. So this is a study that was done on MBT. Now this has to do with a number of AXIS-1 and AXIS-2 diagnoses. And the thing that I want to point your attention to is that at 18 months, this is just a well-informed, structured clinical management of BPD. That is just general psychiatrists who really understand BPD trying to manage the problem. And at 18 months, compared to MBT, MBT does better because it focuses on personality disorders than just, you know, like a structured clinical management when it comes to the comorbidity with AXIS-1 disorders. But when it comes to comorbidity with other personality disorders, when you just have BPD, the outcomes are decently comparable between a structured clinical management and MBT. So when people just have BPD, they might really do well first with a general psychiatric management approach, and it's when they have three or four personality disorder features that these splits get more progressive. Okay, and this is just a graphical kind of representation. This is at one personality disorder. They're not that different, but at four, three or four, they become really divergent. Now, this is the end. I think I made it. So new directions for treatment. I think one of the primary things that people, Peter and Anthony is, are trying to work on is um, treatment of antisocial personality disorder. It's a really significant public health concern. Many people believe antisocial personality disorder is untreatable, like borderline personality disorder was once thought to be. And they're trying to design this program, um, their program in MBT, to help patients who, or prisoners who have antisocial personality. They're trying to adapt this as a general model that you can adjust to people with depression with or without BPD. So with BPD, you have to actually monitor their level of mentalizing and their attachment activation, and then go through certain steps, whereas people with depression and not BPD, you can do without that part of it, okay? Same other components. There's some trials going on with eating disorders and BPD, and like I just presented, MBT may turn out to be superior from the most complex presentations. So to end, I'm just going to speak to some strengths and weaknesses of this model. No treatment is a cure-all. And I think really kind of blind following of one treatment as the best and others as really devalued is really not that helpful to the community or the patients that it treats. But trying to have a flexible view of what works in each treatment is, I think, optimal. And the strengths of MBT is that it's a generalizable model of psychotherapy. Because these days, because of evidence-based medicine, people are pitching single treatments to single disorders when patients actually usually have more than one. 
okay? And what this does is really pitch it at a basic process of psycho, psychotherapy, that is trying to help people think about themselves and others and trying to um, strengthen and stabilize that capacity as the basis of any treatment so that they can take in new information. This has been tested actually in a public health context. It's not in a rarefied setting with just experts. It's in a public health context. And it has this kind of um, balance between integrating traditional psychoanalytic ideas with modern evolving neuroscientific findings. But there are certainly limitations. We run trainings for MBT um, at McLean. It costs a lot of money, as does DBT training, as does TFP training. And it, it involves a lot of dedication, learning, and supervision by its practitioners. And that's not practical for everybody. It, it's helpful for advancing our understanding of these treatments, but might not be helpful for dissemination of these treatments. Um, they occur in specialist contexts. They are simple on the surface, but, um, but MBT is simple on the surface, but complex in practice. You actually have to just be a good therapist to pull off any of these treatments really well. And you also need the therapist to have a robust capacity for attachment and mentalization. So this is how you can reach me or my uh, uh, right-hand person, Anna Rodriguez Villa, about more learning uh, about what we do teach in our BPD Training Institute. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have some excellent questions. We'll try to get a couple in before the break. Um, there are a couple of questions speaking to either basically what we might call stepped care models. Um, for people in the audience that aren't familiar with them, it's where you might start with one treatment and see how that works, then go to another one if it's not working, or potentially integrating or having different courses of the treatment. So um, can MBT and DBT be integrated? Um, or has any work been done with DBT skills training with MBT-based individual therapy? That question was planted to promote PR for the Gunderson residents. <laughs> Actually, we do combine these treatments at the Gunderson residents, and basically what we do is a kind of culture and core of DBT, because the beauty of DBT is prepackaged. It's there. The counselors can learn it. The team can communicate over shared knowledge base and set of skills. And it just makes the treatment more cohesive. But the problem is it doesn't breed a lot of spontane spontaneity of thinking. There can be like an over rigidification of the skills. So there's this like blind application of skills without an understanding of what the problem is for a person or the interpersonal problem that prompted the set of distressing affective behavioral responses that occur. So we balance this with MBT. Now, I don't actually advise that people necessarily do that because it takes incredible amounts of team communication and rigorous formulation to make the pieces of this actually make clinical sense. But if you have a setup where you can be thoughtful and talk a lot with your team, I think it can work and enhance the different aspects of both. Great. Um, so in working with children or families in chronic social or environmental stress, um, what challenges might affect the implementation of MBT, for example, can you potentially mentalize when you're in a situation of chronic stress or adversity, and how might that be addressed in treatment? You know, this is where I do think um, this kind of stepwise approach does help, is that whether it's a child in a chronically stressful situation or a person with BPD who's stuck in stage one, like lots of crises, behavioral dysregulation, they have too many problems to think about themselves. You know, they're just dealing with one fire after another. So sometimes you do have to get into either a situational change or a period of giving them more skills to calm all that down so that they can think. When you have too many things going on in front of you, you can't think whether you have BPD or not. So I think one intervention is to really reduce that level of stress by a combination of environmental changes and um, by supporting some skills to help the families to also have what I think is the number one intervention that residential treatment accomplishes, which is familyectomy, okay? So that the families and the patients can separate 
and reconstitute their ability to think because they get in such stressful situations that they cannot think and they're just reacting to each other. So sometimes these situational changes can facilitate the ability to help someone mentalize more. And actually, a lot of people who come from the Manhattan area in particular, after they do our treatment, we send them to TFP because they're more functional, they're more able to think about themselves, they're more able to kind of evaluate the interactions that happen on the fly in relationships. So I do think there's like an argument for a stage-wise Wide, wise approach. Yeah, that was actually one of the questions we had was, do you think it's um, possible to have a pyramid where you start with DBT and get essential skills, move on to MBT to learn to mentalize, and then go to D TFP? That's what we might do, but that costs a lot of money. <laughs> and um, I don't think that's actually necessary. And at the APA, I gave it a, a presentation on co-occurring personality disorders. Um, things like NPD, ASPD with BPD. And you know what happens is in a program like ours where we have the wealth of resources to try different things, more of good things don't necessarily make people better. It's really understanding the patient at hand and trying to figure out how much they can use therapy and how much they need to just build a life to get some self-esteem, to regulate their behavior, their ways of using time, to structure their relationships. So for some patients who don't respond to treatment, I actually advocate for like a get a life track and support in getting a life. I think too many treatments remove people from life and then you let them out and they've got nothing going, so how are they gonna actually cope? So I think that's actually a problem to this kind of we do this thing called, like, what I've called in this recent book that we've done, Mood Disorders and Borderline Personality, is premature diagnostic certainty with therapeutic overkill. <laughs> so if you have a person that looks maybe bipolar or borderline, they go down these really exclusive paths of getting really toxic medication regimens, and they might not even have bipolar disorder, or getting heavy amounts of psychotherapy when they have something that needs to be biologically treated. So keeping a flexible and open state of mind about what are the specific problems, not just the diagnosis, I think will help us all do better treatment. Um, we're out of time. There's some excellent questions, so we'll save them for the panel discussion. But thank you very much, Dr.